15. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, so in January of 2021, like many people, I got a pandemic puppy. Um, his name is Pipo. He's a very good writer's dog's name. And he's been a total bundle of joy. And because I'd been writing a book about the senses of animals, uh, my wife and I tried to make sure that Typo got frequent uh, um, uh, frequent uh, uh, chances to use his most important sense, and that is smell. And many of you may know that smell is important to dogs, but perhaps not just how adapted they are for a life of olfaction. It begins with their nose. If you look at a dog's nose, you'll notice that its nostrils curve round to the side in these apostrophe-like slits. If, a, if you imagine a dog sniffing along a surface, um, you might think that every time it exhales, it would blow away all of the scented molecules that are on that surface and that its sense of smell might flicker in and out like ours does. But that's not the case. Those side slits create vortices of swirling air every time the dog exhales that actually sweep odors into its nose. So whether a dog is breathing in or out, it is getting a continuous influx of scented air into its snout. And unlike us, who has a single stream of air going down into our lungs, um, that our nose, our nose is kind of intercept on the way. A dog's nose splits that airstream in two. So one part goes into the lungs and is for breathing, and another part goes into the nose and especially for smell. So a dog's sense of smell is continuous. It is like a smooth movie rather than the stroboscopic effect that we um, experience. And dogs accentuate the benefits of their hardware by just using their noses all the time. They sniff and smell and explore absolutely everything. So when I go on walks with Typo, we let him guide the walks at least once a day, sniffing to his heart's content. He will smell every new plant that he encounters, very precisely and daintily moving his nose across the leaves and the stems. He will smell patches of pee that other dogs have left behind, which I liken to me checking my social media feed. He gets to know which individuals he knows in the neighborhood have been around this particular spot. Through the smells they leave behind, he can tell things about their health, what they've eaten, what they've been up to. It's an intensely social activity and one that allows Typo with his nose to gaze into the past. He can also gaze into the future. He can smell when things are arriving well beyond, well before they actually appear. He can smell through gaps and cracks. He can smell around corners. And this world of smell is just very different than the world that I experience with my eyes. And it's something that we have taken great pains to allow Typo to experience. Many dog owners haul their dogs along on walks because they see those walks as exercise or a means of traveling from point A to point B. But that is like going on a hike with someone and covering their eyes every time they see an impressive or beautiful view and dragging them along. It deprives dogs of their most important sense. And studies have shown that dogs are happier, more optimistic and less anxious when they are allowed to sniff, hence the sniff walks. This idea that other animals exist in a very different sensory world than we do is the core of my book, An Immense World, How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us. And there is a word for this sensory bubble. It is Umwelt. It is German for environment, but it doesn't just refer to the physical environment, not to just the uh, shelves you can see behind me or the chair that I'm sitting on. Umwelt the word Umwelt refers to an animal's sensory environment, the sensory bubble in which it is trapped. It is the sights and sounds and smells and textures that it can perceive and that other animals or individuals, even standing in the same physical space, might not be able to perceive. 
So I could be holding Typo right now and he would smell things I can't smell. I, however, would be able to see a hundred times more colours than he can perceive, reds and violets that his eyes can't detect. Each of us is um, limited. Each of us is only perceiving this thin sliver of the fullness of reality. And that is what the umbelt is. To me, this is one of the most beautiful and profound concepts in all of biology. For a start, it's very humbling. We humans, for all of our vaunted intellect and technological abilities, are as limited as other creatures are. We are all perceiving just a small fraction of what there is to perceive. Um, and, but despite that, I think that the Umwelt concept is also incredibly expansive because it tells us that even in our most familiar surroundings, even here in my home, in the garden that I can now look out upon, there are still wonders to be held. There are, um, there is, there are flickers of the magical in the mundane and the extraordinary in the ordinary. And while we may not be able to perceive them ourselves, we can learn about what those hidden realms are like by considering the experiences of the other creatures around us. So for example, I can currently see mockingbirds and house finches flying about in my garden. They, like all birds, have eyes on the sides of their heads, which means that their visual world wraps around them. So when they're uh, what they see when they walk is not just coming towards them as it is for us with our forward facing eyes, but moving towards and away from them at the same time. They can also see this entire dimension of colours that we cannot see. Um, we can probably make out about a million different colours. Birds around us can make out a hundred times more than that. And there's not really any easy way for us to imagine that to appreciate that. But the world looks totally different when you have that kind of vision, and especially when, can, when you can see ultraviolet colors that we cannot see. So to a bee or a bird that can see an ultraviolet, flowers that might seem monochrome to us have completely different patterns on them. So a sunflower has a bullseye of vivid ultraviolet in its middle to guide pollinators to sources of nectar. Similarly, many birds that where, where the males and females look identical to us, like robins, both the Eurasian and American, are actually very different to each other. And the American robin has a red breast that looks identical on the males and the females, but on the males, the breast also blazes with ultraviolet. So robins have no um, uh, problem telling the sexes apart while humans struggle to. And then many animals have senses that we completely lack. Turtles and songbirds have the ability to detect the Earth's magnetic field. They have compasses inside their head that allow them to orient themselves on their long migrations. Um, many fish have the ability to sense the electric fields given off by other living things. And some of those fish can create those electric fields themselves, like living batteries. They then detect how those fields are distorted by conducting objects in the water around them, like plants and other animals, or insulating objects like rocks. They can even use their electric fields to talk to each other, communicating with these electrical choruses that abound in the waters of Africa and South America and that we cannot perceive. The water is also full of signals that we can't sense. When a fish swims, it leaves behind a track, a trail of swirling currents that humans have no chance of perceiving, but that a seal with its very sensitive whiskers can. A seal can detect the path and presence and direction of a fish minutes after it has swum past. Bats have an incredible ability called echolocation. They can produce high-pitched calls and by detecting very precisely how long it takes for those calls to echo back at them, map the world around them accurately enough to find their way through dark caves or to snatch insects from the wing. Dolphins have the same skill, but underwater echolocation also allows them to peer through flesh. 
So a dolphin echolocating on a scuba diver can sense their lungs, the shape of their skeletons, perhaps even if they're carrying an unborn child. These abilities are extraordinary. And I think they're extraordinary not just because they change our understanding of what animals can do, but because they transform our understanding of the world around us. When I go for walks with Typo, I see the sidewalks of my neighborhood in a completely different way by thinking about what he is smelling and see what he pays attention to, perhaps some random piece of pavement that I had completely ignored. I understand how much hidden information is in that world. There are many examples like this. There are little insects called tree hoppers and leaf hoppers that abound in the parks and gardens around us. They fill those plants um, with vibrational songs that we cannot hear, they're not audible to us, but that we can transform into audible sounds with a clip-on microphone and an amplifier. If you do that, what you hear are beautiful melodies, haunting and ethereal, more like birdsong or musical instrument than the simple chirps of most insects. And the idea that the meadows and fields and parks around us are full of all these hidden vibrational signals is magical to me. Humans um, have also harmed other animals around us by failing to consider their umbelt, their sensory world. We have flooded the world with light in um, dark places and uh, sound in quiet places. And these forms of sensory pollution can be as damaging as plastics on a beach or chemicals billowing from a smokestack, even though they feel less viscerally bad to us. We don't think of them as pollutants. We think of light as something good, something synonymous with safety and knowledge and um, and uh, all things that are good in the world. We want more of it. But in fact, by putting sensory information out into the world at times and places it doesn't belong, we're harming the creatures around us. We're killing songbirds as they migrate, turtles as they hatch from a beach, pushing animals away from idyllic places where they would otherwise thrive. And we are also severing our own connection from nature. There is a reason why in the early pandemic, people started talking about hearing birds much more than they previously had done. That's not because the birds were suddenly flocking back into places where humans weren't. It wasn't the nature is healing meme that was so widely put out. It was because we could suddenly hear creatures who were all around us and who our own activities were masking the noise of all the time. Since moving to Oakland and California, I can hear so many birds around me all the time, more than a dozen species from this office, several dozen more just by walking around our neighborhood. And that makes me feel connected to the nature around me far more than in my earlier life. I know how, um, I know how full of life even my neighborhood is. And I can't stress enough how important that is. We live at a time of great ecological peril, of the sixth extinction of wildlife. And why would we choose to protect or to safeguard the creatures around us if we don't care about them? If we don't care about them, if we don't feel that they are important parts of our normal daily existences. I think thinking about their sensory worlds, about the Umwelt concept, is one path towards them. It's a path towards greater curiosity and greater empathy with the other creatures who share our planet with us. And it's um, a way of understanding that by considering their lives, we understand how much of the world around us we are missing, how much we've allowed ourselves to be disconnected from. This ability to think about the sensory worlds of other creatures, the umbelt of another species, is a gift. And it is, to all accounts, by all accounts, a uniquely human one. Typo isn't sitting there thinking, how many colors do I see? What am I hearing that he does not? But I can. I can make a choice to step beyond the confines of my own umbelt into his or the mockingbirds I see or any other creature that I can think of, the spider building a web in the corner of my office. That is beautiful gift, a unique and singular one. And I think it is one that we should cherish and use. Thank you.